Well, as Mary uh, indicated, I'm starting a series this week, all based on poems written by James Weldon Johnson in the voice of a black preacher collected in a volume called God's Trombones. And I want you to hear the first one read by James Weldon Johnson himself, recorded many years ago. And I'm gonna ask Blake to get that up and going. The creation is from my volume, God's Trombones. Read at Columbia University, December 24th, 1935. James Weldon Johnson. And God stepped out on space. And he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. Then God smiled and the light broke. And the darkness rolled up on one side, and the light stood shining on the other. And God said, that good. Then God reached out and took the light in his hands. And God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun. And he set that sun ablazing in the heavens. And the light that was left from making the sun, God gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling the night with the moon and stars. Then down between the darkness and the light, he hurled the world. And God said, that's good. Then God himself stepped down. And the sun was on his right hand. The moon was on his left. The stars were clustered about his head, and the earth was under his feet. And God walked, and where he trod, his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bulged the mountains up. Then he stopped and looked and saw that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world, and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes, and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands, and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down. The cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted, and the little red flowers blossomed. The pine tree pointed his finger to the sky, and the oak spread out his arms. And the lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground, and the rivers ran down to the sea. Then God smiled again, and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land, and he said, bring forth, bring forth, and quicker than God could drop his hand. Fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods, and split the air with their wings. And God said, that's good. Then God walked around and God looked around on all that he had made. He looked at his sun and he looked at his moon and he looked at his little stars. He looked on his world with all its living things. And God said, I'm lonely still. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river he sat down. With his head in his hands, God thought and thought, till he thought, I'll make me a man. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay, and by the bank of the river he kneeled him down. And there the great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand, this brave God, like a mammy bending over her baby, kneels down in the dust, boiling over a lump of clay, till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he breathed the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. Amen.
you'll hear a number of voices in the next few weeks reading those poems, but it's good to hear his voice. Now I've got to back up a little bit to make this, give it a context for why I want to talk about it. And yes, I do write my things down, but that doesn't mean I'm stuck to the words on the page, but you don't want me to go on for another hour. So that's how I stay in place. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that churches choose ministers for odd reasons. They may not even know the reason themselves, but I am quite positive that the first church that chose me to be their minister wanted a trombone player. My predecessor played the trombone in the town band. It was a little town, it was a little band, they needed a trombone. And surely one of these potential ministers could play the trombone as well as deliver a sermon and I was that fellow. No, it probably was more of a happy coincidence, but these coincidences are what make the warp and woof of life, the unexpected, unknown and fortuitous experiences. What makes one person a great friend and another person a mere acquaintance? We don't know, but it's the happy coincidences that unfold into a friendship. Something unexpected strikes you like a bell. You, you resonate with recognition. That church in Massachusetts resonated to my playing the trombone. And that's why I got the job. I'm sure there was a resonance I heard when I met my wife for the first time. Long ago, as a young minister, I was reading a book on preaching and the author was a fellow named Henry Mitchell. He was a black man and who mentioned a book of poetry, God's Trombone, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. There's the cover. I went out and got it because I was intrigued. As a trombone player, the title resonated with me. Then I saw the man's name, James Weldon Johnson. Weldon is my first name. I almost never ever see it, but there it was on a book about a trombone player talking about a preacher. Well, you don't get much more resonance than that. I had to read this book. I have three messages to share with you today. The first is listen for the resonance. This universe is one fabric, and that means anything over here can resonate with something over there. The search for the meaning of life begins with resonance. And not just individuals, whole groups can resonate as well, especially religions. They are, after all, communities that were formed of people who felt a resonance about something. We share a resonance, for example, we Unitarian Universalists share a resonance with the idea of liberty, of freedom, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief. We champion that. That's the thing that draws people in, that you're free to make up your own mind, to choose your own beliefs, the free spirit the church of the free spirit. That's different from so many other religious communities. That also resonates with the love of liberty in the African-American religious tradition. Though their Christianity was imposed by their enslavers, they nonetheless found out stories like Exodus, Moses. They found out from Paul, that in Christ there is neither slave nor free. The civil rights movement grew out of the church communities around them because that was the institutional expression of their long road to freedom, to borrow from Nelson Mandela. There, you'll be seeing this coming up on PBS this week. I am so looking forward to watching this story of the black church. I hope you take time to watch it as well. So therefore the black church resonates with freedom in ways of its own, similar to us, but different too. Which brings me to my second point. 
listen also for the dissonance, the difference as well as the similarity. The real excitement comes, the real learning comes when we go beyond the similarity and discover the difference. Resonance is the open door, dissonance is what lies beyond the door. When we, when we say freedom, it means liberty to be yourself, an individual, to be distinct. Black faith in that tradition speaks of freedom from, freedom from danger, oppression, and racism. One is about individuality, the other one is about community. Both are true and neither are complete by themselves. Indeed, there cannot be one without the other. That's why we need dissonance, even more than resonance. <clears throat> Through the doorway of the resonance, we find out what we don't know, what we haven't explored, what we need to learn. That's why dissonance is important because we only learn what differs from what we already know. And I have found three forms of dissonance for us. One is this different notion of freedom. Unitarian Universalism has been primarily about freedom found in individualism, like this picture. Look at that, free, open, arms akimbo, walking alone through nature. That's what we think of when we think of freedom. But clearly, that is not the whole meaning. It's not enough. If we wish, it's also not enough if we wish to speak meaningfully to those who are not already Unitarian Universalist. But it goes even further. We need that other meaning as well. Mere individualism is just that, mere. It is insufficient, insufficient as a spiritual value. The same Professor Mitchell, who, whose book informed me of James Walden Johnson's book, puts it this way, and here I'm quoting, the human predicament is universal, but what grew, yea, burned in the hearts of American slaves and freed many of them will work in America's affluent suburbs as well. He is saying that the other tradition of freedom born among the enslaved peoples of the, of the Americas has something to preach to us, something we can learn, something we need to learn. And that's the second form of dissonance. If we need to speak of freedom in new ways so we can be heard, we need to hear it in new ways so we can learn. Our future as liberal religionists may depend, utterly depend on our willingness to learn from new voices including the African-American religious experience. And the third form of dissonance is recognizing that the traditions many of us have rejected still have something to teach us, including the Bible. As I said last week, the Bible is used to justify many things, but it's also used to justify the things we believe in. And just as that culture can teach us new meanings of freedom, it can also teach us new ways to relate to those who are different from us, but believe in it. That's where these Negro sermons and verse come in. Johnson purloins the voice, as it were, of the black preacher, the hub of their spiritual world, to retell familiar stories from the Bible in a way no evangelical or even mainstream Christian would allow, but also with a literalism that skeptics like us might find difficult. It is exactly the spiritual challenge we need to hear, lest we settle our backsides into too habitually thinking that we know it all into what the author Pierre Burton called the comfortable pew of knowing already what the preacher is going to say. Johnson's first sermon, the one you heard today, which you heard the author read, tells the story in a very literalist way that none of us would affirm. And what story could be more contentious, prompting so many evangelicals to stuff boards of education and state legislatures with pious and principled folk trying to get evolution out and creationism in and to fight against same sex and different sexualities. That's their whole basis, isn't it? How could we, 
the realists and scientists ever take a story like that seriously. However baldly anthropomorphic it sounds, Johnson's version of God actually has a radical new idea in it that undermines the other idea that we think is the only one there. Let's see what he has to say. Back to that picture. Look at that picture. Look at those words. What does Johnson's God say after to begin things? God's, Johnson's God says, I'm lonely. What a notion. Think about it. From Augustine to Aquinas to our own day, God is supposed to be supremely separate, serene, aloof, awesome. Johnson's God is lonely. Thank you, Blake. After all, what fun is it to be God if you're all alone? So Johnson's God conceives mischief, something for fun. Because he's lonely, he creates a world. He wants to play. God smiles and the light emerges. He rolls it up into a snowball and throws it into the sky to create the sun. And all the shavings are thrown into the sky as stars. God stomps in the dirt to make continents and he spits out oceans and lakes. As if decorating for a party, God then says, bring forth, come on in, olly olly oxen free. And the world comes alive with animals, fish, birds, insects, plants, and trees. Of course, what good is being a creator if you have no one to play with? I'm lonely still, God says. And he sat down and he thought, and then... In this phrase, I think, is so dramatically different from our idea of God, like a mammy bending over her baby. God makes a human being, not with the word, not with a labor, but as a parent nursing a child. The climax of the tale brings God to his knees and likens him to a mother. Now, just imagine using that image in some conventionally white evangelical church and see how far that would go. We civilized folk, for with our stately and decorous ways, tend to think that liveliness and merriment and neediness are not only undignified, they're not even close to godly. But James Weldon Johnson and the faith community he knows have a God who laughs, who longs, who leans, who learns, who loves and wants to love. This God is kind of fun. Someone you might want to hang out with. I want you to subdue your empiricism, your rationalism, your skepticism for just a while, because this fable tells us something we need to know. That God needs us. We are part of something cosmically precious. That the loneliness of God is the reason for our being. Our purpose is not to obey orders, but to play, play by the rules. As we do on this swings when we take our turns and go down the slide and allow the next kid to go. Our purpose is to be free so that we can have fun with each other, us and God. True, the Bible does speak of God as a father and we as children. But only in this version of creation does God actually act like a dad. Laughing, playing, caring, and presumably as delighted with our discovering our freedom as human parents. 
I'm looking at all of you younger parents out there. And the most fun part of being a parent is watching your child explore, discover, take delight in the world. How much more fun is it than watching your child learn and become strong and capable? Well, what if that's why we exist? What if the universe wants us to be here so we can delight the universe with our freedom and our growth and our learning? Let that sink in. Let it sink in that perhaps we exist to delight the universe. What would it mean if we knew we were loved just because we existed. And I want you to consider the moral implications of this, our liberty, our precious individuality, that which we prize so much, so deeply as religious liberals, is not something we have by moral right. It's because we were loved. We are not loved because we are free. We are free because we are loved. That's a difference. And that brings me to today, because today is Valentine's Day, the day celebrating love, right? Now, next year, I'll take you on the journey of love, which, believe me, is not as much fun as it sounds. But right now, I want you to notice that for James Weldon Johnson and the community he articulates, God's love is the reason for their being, their dignity, their liberty. While society was saying that people of African ancestry were less low, inadequate, insufficient, not worthy of love, they were telling each other, no, the God that I met in the Bible loves me, loves us, loves us into being, loves us into freedom. Ten years ago, the Unitarian Universalist Association ushered in a program called Standing on the Side of Love. It was pointed primarily at the LGBTQ community. But we've taken it further and realized that if we don't stand on the side of love when it comes to people of different racial communities, we are stopping short of truly standing on the side of love. If we love, how can we not stand for those who are not loved by others? And if we do not stand for those who are not loved, how can we claim to stand for justice at all? For Johnson and his community, it is we humans who have erased, debased, and demeaned, not God. And of course, African Americans have endured more affliction as a people than any other group, save perhaps the native peoples on this continent. And yet they still believe that they are loved, that God wanted them to be because God loved them into being. They could have focused on a God who got even, who brought vengeance, who righted all the wrongs by subordinating those who hated them and lifting up those who had, been fall, who had fallen. They could have emphasized injustice and justifiably lifted up bitterness and sorrow as a reason to resist. But instead, they resist not to get even, but to claim their rights as loved creatures, loved by the same God that others worship. Their doctrines perhaps are not ours, meaning Unitarian Universalists, but their hopes are exactly ours. Reason, our great claim to fame, demands that we explore that part of freedom that does not resonate, but challenges us to move beyond who we are. If it be hard, remember that we cannot grow unless we listen to difference, not just similarity. Much of that resonance and dissonance are in fact found in the Bible, but they're refracted in this case through a culture that experienced something different than you and me. That culture reminds us that the Bible is not just a text to be revered or analyzed or even rejected, but words spoken by humans who lived long ago who told these stories to each other as one tells family stories or recites poems or sings songs during a family gathering. African-American culture treats the Bible as an elder to be respected, loved, revered, but not worshiped. And so can we. So I'm asking you to be a learner 
for the next few weeks, to listen to his voice as it recites these words that are old and familiar, but not the same words that you think they are, to listen to his voice through other voices, the words of one man, certainly, but also the sound of a people retelling stories we rarely tell because we find them hard to believe. And I want you to let these friends of freedom teach you about what it means to be free. Well, I've used up too much of your time. Our hour was longer than it should have been in the first place. But I need you to remember a few things. Remember, resonance, listen for it. It is the siren that calls you to a truth you need to learn. Dissonance, go past the resonance to the thing you don't like and you don't know and listen to it even longer. And remember, therefore, that freedom is more than what I have and what you have. It is what we have, that we have much to learn about it. And there's one more thing, one more thing, perhaps the most important thing. Remember that it's just possible that there might be a God who was lonely and needed someone to love. <laughs>